This episode of the Troxel Podcast is made possible with support from Arc IT. Are you tired of standard IT services that miss the mark? Choose Arc IT for specialized, proactive IT management, BIM support, and robust data security tailored for architects. Whether you're a team of 10 or a growing firm of 50 plus, Arc IT understands the architecture industry and will empower your unique creative vision to enable you to do your best work. Embrace a technology team that enhances, not hinders, your design process. Visit getarcit.com for your free IT assessment and start transforming your firm and your tech experience today. That's G E T A R C H I T.com. Welcome to the Troxel Podcast. I'm Evan Troxel. And in this episode, I'm talking with Phil Reed and Adam Thomas about the complexities of transitioning into leadership within digital and strategic roles in an AEC firm. We talk about the crucial balance between technical know-how and soft skills, cultivating interpersonal relationships, stress management, mentorship, where to go to foster skills and behaviors, accountability, and more. You'll also learn about AEC Acoustics, an innovative retreat blending leadership and technical skill enhancement through collaborative discussions, which I will be attending in just over a month from now. And just for listeners of this show, Phil and Adam have extended an incredibly generous offer to get the early bird pricing, even though that time has already passed. So on the registration form, you'll see Phil's email address, and once you register, you can email him and let him know that you heard about it here, and you'll get that early bird price. You can find the link to learn more about AEC Acoustics and register in the show notes for this episode or on my website at trxl.co. You can also visit aecacoustics.com. Please help this podcast by subscribing wherever you listen, and if you'd like to receive an email when episodes are published with all of the links, like I just talked about, and other information from the episode, sign up at trxl.co. You can also directly support the show by becoming a member at the site as well. As always, thank you so much for listening, and now, without further ado, I hope you enjoy this conversation about mastering leadership transitions in AEC Tech with Phil Reed and Adam Thomas. Phil and Adam, welcome to the Troxel Podcast. It's great to have you both here, and Phil, it's been a while since we chatted. It was... Denver Airport, United yep. Lounge, yep. Uh, and I'm going to put links to those episodes in the show notes, but something you said during that conversation, uh, it really piqued my interest. And part of the conversation was about the transition in leadership, especially when it comes to like digital tools and strategy. And there's there's kind of a technical side to it. And then there's this transition to leading a team. And you talked a little bit about that during our last conversation there. And that being a difficult transition for a lot of people, we, we work yeah. our way up solving problems, working with the tools, really technically oriented. And then it's like the next step in that natural progression is, okay, now you're going to lead people to do that same thing. Oh, it'll be and, easy. It's, and then we, we trip over those speed bumps that happen, yeah. right? So like set, set up the, the beginning of this conversation. Let's just go from, from that and let's elaborate on that a little bit because I think it's going to lead us in some interesting well, that, pathways. You know, there is the the kind of truism that you get promoted to your point of incompetence. Yeah, right. There's a name to that rule. I can't yeah. remember what it is off the top of my head, but but we it should is do this thing. like Rogan and go, Adam, look that up for me. Can you right. what's that what that thing called? <laughs> it's not Murphy's Law. It's something else. I don't but, have I don't have an intern at my fingertips. So yeah. Right. <laughs> no, so there so with that's the thing that happened to me and if I had known there was a strategy like read these books or go to these things or talk with these people because it's going to be stressful, then I would have known that being stressed is okay. But when you don't know why it's stressful and it just feels completely unfamiliar, it becomes even more stressful. So I mm. really struggled with that. And then only to find out like there's been people that have attended uh, the leadership retreat after the fact that I managed during that very stressful time and said, Oh, you're the best boss I ever had. It was great. And I thought, 
you weren't inside my head. I was, I was, I was barely hanging on, man. Like, yeah, it was so, I didn't know what I would, what I had accomplished at, at, when I was at Autodesk. I knew at the end of a day, a week, a month, a quarter, mm -hmm. like in detail, what stuff did we do to help the customer? And then I went to a place where I don't even know if the decisions we're talking about are going to happen in a year. How do I know I'm making the right decision? And so it was very stressful. I still find it stressful. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting predicament to to get yourself into without like this is not the kind of thing you get trained for in school ever. Right? So mm. if there is, let me know that that exists because I don't know that that exists. It's just it's like and and I saw this with other positions as well. It's like you become you get promoted to becoming a project manager. Like there was no in architecture, there was no project management school. There was and, and it was just like you just learn by doing along the way. But then all of a sudden it goes from maybe you're doing one project to now you've got five projects and all of a sudden you're you're overloaded. You got to and you get you get buried deep right and and it's like where do you go for help and i think that that to me is what is kind of interesting and, and maybe kind of the theme about what we're talking about today is like where do you go for help where do you get these skills? well the money How trail to go up? higher up in the organization is tempting right and i mean that's like oh i should follow the money right that's what adults do that's the but natural then you progression might, right yeah but the thing is well, one of the things we talked about in Denver was the process of becoming a technical high performer. It's okay if that's trial and error because you can squirrel yourself away after hours mm. and just put your head down and figure out a way that that'll work, that you can implement. And that trial and error is invisible to everyone else. But trial and error with people, it doesn't work. You'll end up alienating customer, you'll alienate your staff. You'll alienate your business partner. Hey, Adam. No alienation. <laughs> I think Adam does way better at it. He's more of a extrovert than me, I would, I would say, in that he works with a team of people that works with big customers. And I primarily just still work with end customers and I have to you know, periodically connect to the team that makes software that, that we're implementing. But... Yeah, having a team of people that are unpredictable, and uh, yeah, I still find it stressful. But, but it is stressful. Going, yeah, it is stressful. Okay, well then you just accept the stress. Yeah, I, right. Yeah, yeah. roll okay. with the punches a little bit. Yeah. So, Adam, talk about that transition. I mean, you you're the youngest here, so you've gone through this probably the the most recently. I, I definitely sure. went through this transition myself, and I'm happy to talk about it. And I know Phil, we talked about it a little bit in our last set of conversations in on the podcast but so so you you we've all been through this and i think navigating this is something that we're all going to have different experiences with and how how we accomplish navigating that but to phil's point earlier about this becomes you know it's attractive because there's more money but there's more money because the expectation is now you're going to multiply your skills amongst right. a team and you're going to help take our organization to the next level but there's not necessarily a a thorough roadmap of how to do that right it's like figure it out which is this is the this is architecture in general right, right. this is you know how to figure things out and i i have faith that you're going to figure this out because i don't have time to train you how to do it i don't know what the resources are we all learn differently we've all done it a different way and somehow it's all just kind of worked out and i'm sure it's not going to be any different with you go but what was your experience <laughs> like well so yeah i am the youngest um, but i i think i threw myself into it because i saw a problem with the first few architecture companies i worked with there was no direct path mm -hmm. it was i'm going to be a bin manager and you're only going to talk to two people and actually the first one I worked with said that I wasn't allowed to talk to certain studios. But, so I couldn't effectively be a BIM manager then because I have to talk to the studios, the people, to be able to increase productivity. Um, it's a psychological problem, not a technical problem. And so I think for 15 years, I've been fascinated by the psychology of people more than the technical output of people. And if I can somehow roll with the punches enough to get someone to be successful in their own life, it comes back to their professional life, which goes back to their personal life and it keeps building on each other. Um, 
And so I would rather get on the phone with someone and say, you know, how can I, how can I de-stress you or how can I help alleviate some stress in the next 10 minutes? And with some clients, it's literally, they just want to talk about their grandkids Mm -hmm. because no one at the office wants to do that. But that's coming from a place of a consultancy. Mm -hmm. I get told all the time that the way we deal with architecture firm A or construction firm B, if they tried to deal with it internally the same way, they would be told to leave. So there's a, a position of kind of privilege. I, 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 privilege to say like this outside resource, we're going to listen to them, even though that same internal person has said it before. And I've, I've talked right. with those managers yeah. and I don't think they are ignoring the internal manager. I don't think they're, in, they're ignoring that internal person. I think what that internal person has done is they've built up a kind of a tremendous wall in front of them and they're talking at people instead of with people or they're talking to directly or they're making it all about them versus everyone around them. And we can come in and say, oh, well, you figured it out. I just did the last 2%. Yeah. We can highlight the person without fear of our job being compromised. There's where an internal person might be guarded. Yeah, there's politics, yep. there's baggage, yep. and and you're you're talking about kind of a, a counselor or a therapist relationship, sure. right? Where where it's like I'm paying for this outside ear, and they they're going to listen to me. I can and that that it's not different oh, than it's, going it, to a therapist, it, right? It's not just about the job, and I like the way that Adam frames this. Our our company. The goal of our company is to take people's stress away. And that Always takes lots been. of forms. Yeah. So if, you're, if your job is to be a great Revit technical person, I think you're, you're coming up short. If your job is to take people's stress away, whether you're making a cup of coffee for someone, whether you're helping them figure out a, a, you know, a complicated family component or a construction issue, really, they're just paying you to help take their stress away. And that's how we always have framed it. And Adam was the one that brought that up. And I was like, yeah, it's a really good. That's like, to me, it's like a principle-based approach to what is your big goal? What is the overarching goal? How do you, how did you come up with that framing, Adam? Because I think it, it, do you think it's innate to you is my question, I guess, or do you think it's something that you learned in how to deal with this and how to open people up when they're coming to you with a high stress situation that they need this problem solved right away? I'm, I'm, I'm curious about where that came from. So I, it, it's probably not innate. I can give a lot of credit to my father and mother because they had me at a really young age. They had to work twice as hard to move forward in life. And they took a tremendous amount of risk. They, they might not have been the best parents or the worst parents, but at the end of the day, they took ownership for what was going to happen and move forward with it. And where I grew up in the small town, Northeast Georgia, it's called Gumlog, um, the closest big town is Tacoa, realistically. Um, so, you know, 28,000 people. Um, Gumlog has 1,200 people. And it was you and your word are all you have, nothing else. So you really dig into you as a person becomes kind of your book or being, and then that's the only way you can move through life. So you never... You never cross anyone. You never allow someone to go stressed out for multiple days or multiple weeks. You always help where you can. And I think, I think I was doing that at a really early age. Now I was, I was part of a church at a really early age. So we had like elderly outreach and things like that. I got, I got, I was able to help people just all the time. Mm-hmm. And had those opportunities, right. I had the yeah. opportunities to do it. And I don't think you have as many opportunities in larger cities or in certain family structures. In our family structure, we kind of had to help each other. My dad was one of like 12 kids, right? So you had to help each other. And um, with your word being your bond, you didn't really have contracts where I came from. I had to learn how to write a contract after school. It was just, can we shake on it and let's do it? (laughs) And I was trusted to do it. And that's a really hard thing to just teach someone. You have to let them do it. And then you have to hold them accountable. I was being held accountable as a six-year-old, an eight-year-old. And so accountability comes natural. But now we have 30-year-olds transitioning into management and they want the leadership and management position, but they don't want the accountability necessarily. And I would rather have the negative so that my team doesn't get it. Mm -hmm. I can sit with a tremendous weight on me for a very long time because I've been doing it for a long time. But that's not something that's easily just 
you know, you can't do it through matriculation is what I always say. I can't just sit with you and all of a sudden you can bear a huge burden and help mm-hmm. your team. You have to work through it. You have to go through some bumps and bruises with everyone. And everyone on our team's been through them with me. And for better or worse, they trust that I'm going to get it done. And every client we have trusts that we're going to get it done. If I can't do it, I ping Phil. If Phil can't do it, he pings Gabe. If Gabe can't do it, we ping Will or Elizabeth or Don. goes on and on. Um, and we, we've got a bit of a network there. I might be at the first touch point sometimes with some of the really stressful stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of treating it as if, what did you used to say, Phil? What's the, if you don't know the answer, don't be afraid to say you don't know the answer, but tell someone you'll find an answer and give yeah, them a just deadline. Say, I don't know. And then do say, it. Let me find out. Yeah. And we've done it's, that for over 10 years now. And that's the only reason we have the client base we do. I think when I just send an email. A, yeah. Yeah. We, we work in a high trust environment. We have very simple contracts. We try to keep them as like, I think our contract is two pages at them. Two pages. Still. That's it. And we try to keep it as clear as possible because ultimately if it takes 20 pages to work with a customer, it's going to get too complicated. And so the advantage of being in a high trust environment where people trust people and you're not just there as a transaction to do a, to do a job for an amount of money, but ultimately to take their stress away, um, right. that ends up building really good relationships with customers because you're they understand you're there for the whole person, for the whole team, not just for here's the product that you wanted, here's your invoice. Yeah. And sometimes projects go sideways and Adam's had situations where projects where, where maybe there's people coming in or some expectations not being met. But if you've built trust, someone else is going to reach across that table for you and go, no, 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 these guys got it. They're, yeah. So that's how we tend to approach it from a, from a, a stress standpoint. If your business isn't taking people's stress away, if all you're doing is providing a transaction, then um, I think you're right for competition. I, but someone I, comes I along to, and says, oh, we do it for a dollar less. And they go, uh uh-uh. no, you can do that for a dollar less, but you can't take my stress away for a dollar less. And these guys do. I, I tell people, at. I tell people all the time that my, my first goal is to meet the goals of the project. My second goal is to get you home to your wife and kids, or your husband and kids five minutes faster today. Yeah. That's it. Those five minutes add up. I have a four-year-old now, so I realize it more than ever that the, that time, it, it always goes away. Mm-hmm. I can't just go to the end of the weekend and say, okay, I would like two hours back with my daughter and wife. I can't do that. And when I'm thanked, and thanking is hard for people to do too, but when I am thanked, I'm not thanked for being a technical expert. I'm thanked because they got to go home one hour early on Friday because I said I would handle it or the team would handle it. If I'm the only one there, I'll open my computer and fix it. If we're still in the office, the team jumps in and fixes it. And months later, they'll say thanks. Isn't that the aspiration of architecture school is that we're going to do this thing and that's going to allow us and afford us all this time to be, you know, the life of the party and, you know, waving our glass and talking about our projects. But the reality is we just work unforgivably long hours Hmm. and then somehow it's worth it. Adam and I say to each other, you can make money, you can't make time. Mm -hmm. So you better find balance. So, Phil, talk about this transition to overseeing a team that you experienced, because I think that's where a lot of like well, that transition is very difficult, as we alluded to early on in the conversation. And and so, like, there is a progression to get to that point. And I think the strategies that Adam just laid out totally have a lot to do with becoming that person, that trusted individual who becomes kind of the go to person to be you know, identified as a potential leader when it comes to digital practice, design technology, BIM support, you know, there's many variations of very similar technology kind of stuff. But because you're so in the weeds with solving problems, tech, operating the applications and the computers and all the different technologies, the way they talk to each other, all these things, now we're adding a layer of soft skills, you know, or people skills on top of that. And that starts to naturally percolate you as the individual to that position for potential becoming that that spot and then all of a sudden you're not doing the technical stuff anymore you're not doing 
the the nitty gritty details. You are making sure people are handling the right things. You you actually have to completely change your day to day, and and that is a really tough transition. Oh, it's easy for me. Managing people is so easy now. I just say, Adam, could you do this thing? And then Adam <laughs> manages the people. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's Take, what, I mean, I could, I've talked to executives now who've run multi hundred person large companies and go, how do you like structurally set this Delegation. Up? Yeah. And well, the, the last time I spoke to a guy that I worked with back in the nineties and he said, well, I have teams of 10 and my team is 10 and they have teams. Each of those people have teams of 10 and it scales, yeah. but I, you it's hard to do that in a small organization because there's, you know, the organizational structure is a phone pole. There's nobody, to, everybody has to do everything. I think Adam's great at it because he has people that he trusts and he delegates to. I don't really have to organize or manage a team. I'm primarily working with the chaos team and leadership of the Enscape and chaos team. Um, I work with directors of so of companies that are implementing software have technical issues primarily around Enscape that's go to market service. But as far as having a team of people under me, I'm I'm still in that weird position of by the time I delegate, I would just do it myself. Um, but you so did sometimes go through if, this transition earlier in your career, right? And and that's kind of where Oh yeah, I, I was think... terrible at it. Yeah, I was terrible. I was stressed out and you can't I mean you're asked, you're like, oh you're smart. You're gonna teach all these people to figure this out. And then I'd find out like Adam and I have a dominant gene where you just can't not show up, where you just can't yep. not get it done. And right. not everybody has that weird dominant gene. And it is a feature in a lot of cases, but it is a horrible bug in a lot of cases. <laughs> um, you know, with three little kids and you got to be there on time and on budget. And I'm the, you know, field marshal trying to march people along. I actually just relax more. So managing teams at a big, big ENA firm, I had a team of people that I managed, probably a dozen people or so. It was stressful and I never felt good at it. I just felt like I was barely above water and I never knew if any decision, I mean, we were solving the technical problems, but there is a, you're so detached from actually solving the problem where you're turning a gear that turns a gear that turns another gear that I don't know, is it turning another gear in the future? Um, I still struggle with that part of it immensely. And I don't have to actually do that a lot in my day to day. What I do really like now from a leadership standpoint is, and, and I've learned a lot of this from Adam and I finally just started talking to people who had been executives in big, successful technical companies going, just talking about, I mean, to be honest, I would go to breakfast with them. That's what I started doing is these guys that I started with a guy that lived in the house, two doors down. He worked at a company called Hayloid, which became Xerox. And he was a technical consultant at the beginning of dry printing. And he loved it. And we would go to breakfast. And Ralph was amazing. And he would tell me stories and I would tell him stories and talk with Ralph on Thursday morning is why Adam and I got in business. Because he's like, well, you should just go into business for yourself. And I, that had never occurred to me in, in that way. So it's the part of it that's easier for me is I've learned not to have the hijack in my stress center of my brain when I hear something that I don't like, because probably I just don't have enough information. And um, there's a, a frame to this. I sent it to Adam actually the other day. It was a it was a, a meaning wave song. Who is he? Who is that guy talking to? It was Akira the Don, and he was talking to Jocko. And so every time he hears something that's bad, quote unquote bad news, he goes, "Oh, good." That's like a frame. Yeah. Oh, you hurt your arm. You, 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 you blew out your knee working out. Good. Now you got time to rest. Uh, you didn't get the promotion. Good. Now you got time to be better. You didn't get the funny round. Good. Now you own more of the company. It's always good. And so I think mm -hmm. the am amygdala hijack is, I guess, what they technically call it, of, of hearing bad information. I just used to kind of get so stressed out. Like, oh, man, I got another thing piled on my plate where now I go, oh, well, I don't know what that means. Let's what, what what's going on? And then when you sit down and actually discuss, you're like, oh, that that's okay, right? Early conversations with Phil when we would talk about this with you know, he he was able to experience 20 years before me, and and go through 20 years of what he calls failures. So I should learn from those failures. Phil that's why it's so public. easy for you. Yeah, right. <laughs> if you have good if you if you have good examples, just don't replicate. Oh, do what he did. Right? 
And yeah. uh, oh, man, if only yeah, my it, children I, would follow would follow this. Hey, path. we make better <laughs> grandparents. We know that. That's right. I'll be, I'll be a right. better granddad. Yeah, I'll be mm-hmm. a terrible grandparent. <laughs> but we we I think we discovered um, the first couple of years of business when when there's an itch, I tend to scratch it, and Phil tends to think around it. Mm. Or if there's pressure, I tend to go toward the pressure. And Phil starts thinking about what the pressure is going to do. And I just attack it because I was approach things different ways. It's good. Yeah. I I don't, I don't mind diving into a pressure situation because in my experience, pressure creates diamonds. So if I finish a presentation, the first question out of my mouth is what could I have done better? Mm -hmm. Now, what itch can we scratch? I don't think that's a normal thing to ask people. Um, but it's because I want people to hold me accountable. Now, Phil wants to be held accountable too. He just doesn't want to be held accountable for people he controls necessarily or people that are under him or people that work for him. I think everyone works with me. No one works for me. Yeah. I like so people. We're to all work, yeah. I like to work with people. I don't like to work yeah. for you, or. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So if you set up that relationship, what happens is your accountability is everyone's accountability. And it, it kind of takes the pressure and distributes it all Evan, at once. The hard, so the hard part I'm okay for me with that. is that there's a mindset and there's a, there's a, a venture capitalist named Evolve that talks about this in terms of the owner's mindset. There's an owner mindset and there's kind of the employee mindset. The owner mindset is you hit, you're, you're the first thing you, when you start to wake up in the morning and it's not even 5 a.m., it's 3.30 a.m. Now your mind is already thinking about, you got to make money for the day. You got to hunt it in the project. You yep. can't just put the pen down at five o'clock at the end of the day. And that owner mindset, both Adam and I have that kind of owner mindset. And I think you want to look for people that have that same owner mindset where they take ownership. Who's the champion? Who's going to see it through? You don't have to chase people. And if they cost a little bit more, it's a bargain. Like, I don't want to so, so hire rare. team members that are going to add stress, right? We're trying to yeah. take stress away. I want people to have the same mindset. They want to work on a team because they take the team stress away. I, I do just... think that, that people are fickle, and Phil is a 1% of 1%er in terms of how he thinks about things. And if he expects that people are going to think about things the same way he does, he's likely not going to find that person. And when he does, that person is going to butt head with, heads with him every damn day. Because they're not going to think exactly the same, but they're both ultra high performers. I've never had a single person reach out to me and say, Phil has failed us. Ever. He might have pissed me off, but he didn't fail us. He, he <laughs> might have said something I didn't agree with, but everyone else agrees with, so we did it. Yeah. And it's like, good. He made you scratch an itch. He made you put things in a pressure chamber. Um, I don't tend to try to look for those people. I tend to try to look for people that have qualities of that 1% person and then give them the tasks that match those qualities so that they can hit home runs more often than sacrifice flies or bunts, right? I want to, I want to, I want to build the field around somebody in a way that makes them succeed versus trying to find someone that can build a new field in order to succeed. Yeah. I don't necessarily need that. Yeah. I I don't think you're getting. I think you're getting to kind of the leadership qualities of finding success means f- find, helping others become successful. And yes. they, y- you oh, are yeah. more concerned about them and, and what happens then with your progression becomes a natural outcome of your helping them achieve their goals and achieve what they mm. are capable of, even if they can't see what they're capable of themselves. You yeah. probably, if you have this relationship with that team like you're talking about you actually can see what they're capable of even if they can't and helping them achieve that raises the whole boat raises everybody oh yeah don't think that adam and i always see eye to eye we have different ways of approaching things he is i think we both have the same kind of characteristics around curiosity around ownership around responsibility and obligation and you know the the thing they say in the south is uh, on time is what is it? Early is on time, on time is late, and late you're fired. We both, but we express them in different ways. And we'll talk about obscure things like even our investment portfolios, the way Adam will approach investments and the way I approach them. We both have had very successful investing experience, but we approach them differently. I think the, uh, the way I tend to look at it overall, I've heard a statistic 
not too long ago, and I'll try to remember the source, that the, the square root of an organization generates half the revenue. Now, if you're talking about a team of 100 people, that's 10 people that generate half the revenue. Right. Oh my gosh, what you could do with that team of 10 people and not have the HR issues and the drama and the politics of 90 more people. And I think technology facilitates that. If you can find the 10 right, curious, high performers and build a team around that, you can run circles. I mean, it's just amazing. And I feel I like we I, have that. The, the, the whole tool stack of what we have at our fingertips now versus five years ago oh, it, is yeah. completely different. And it really speaks to what you were just saying. Like if I was starting my own firm today, one person, I can probably do what five people did five years ago, right? Because right. of technology as a lever, the correct, mm -hmm. using the right technology and the right application can yield so much higher results now because of the interconnectedness of things and the, just the on, onward march of progress here, right? It's, in, we, it's, it's we incredible don't have to a, kind of think what's yeah. going to happen in the next five years. We, we don't have a technical drought though, Evan. We have an interpersonal drought. Agreed. Yeah. I can create a team that makes the best technology in, in my team's mm -hmm. eyes with fewer people than ever. But I still have to go sell that. And selling is about this relationship. Right. If you can't do this, you can't sell anything. You can't create anything. It can Something in a silo or in a bucket off to the side is not really a creation because no one can enjoy it. If I painted and my art never left, left my barn, am I an artist? I might think I'm an artist, but once others start to appreciate you might that be thing, technically I'm really, capable, but it's not. right. I'm te yeah, I'm technically capable of painting, but I'm not an artist yet. And so I feel like something has happened and I, I, I've seen it in the last five or six years where our interpersonal skills have actually dis diminished totally. while our technical skills have increased. So I, I talk to people all the time, yesterday included, I went to lunch with somebody who thinks they are capable of being a leader and they're upset that they're not in a leadership position. And then when I asked them to define leadership, it said nothing about accountability or personal resources or psychology or stress management. Instead, it was, well, I've made all these cool add-ins for our teams and I'm not being respected for it. And I'm like, well, it sounds like you're a technical head. You're not necessarily a, a leader. leader. Yeah, you're, you're, you're a very technical person. How about you work your way into that position? Well, I have to work myself into leadership to be a partner in the yeah, firm. Leadership is not a position. It is a skill set. I always say that leadership is earned, not given as well. You can, you can attempt to mirror leadership-esque qualities, but until others start saying you are a leader, you're not one. It's mm -hmm. hard. It, it, it's a big piece of that. I think, is just building trust, right? You have to build yep. rapport. You have to build trust. Um, and that takes time and early on you build trust and people want to know, okay, what's the angle? What's he trying to get at? You really just have to build honest to goodness trust where people really can rely on you and you're not in it for an angle. And that takes yep. a long time and you can undo it quickly. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, that's a, a big part of it. It's, um, yeah, the leadership piece, I don't know that it's something that just has to be innate. I think people are more empathetic naturally. They're more curious naturally. Uh, or they're either curious or, or not, or they, they have high, high in empathy, or they're high in other kind of characteristics of what good leaders probably do. But I think they can be taught to a point. Otherwise, they're just, well, I felt like I was blind to it. But once somebody pointed out, like, mm -hmm. what are the ingredients? I was like, oh, so those are the ingredients. Oh, I have horrible empathy. I'm, my, I have an impatience gene that's severely dominant. If I'm going to be a good leader, I need to turn that. I need to be aware of it. And, um, once you're aware of the ingredients, like even the craziest thing, Evan, breathing, like breathing is a thing that you could do of not jumping to the answer. Like I tend to get too excited. I want to just jump into the conversation and pile on, but pausing and thinking, or when you get news, like I do breathing exercises and I get stressed out. Oh my gosh, they're amazing. I, like nobody told me about these ingredients. You could just kind right. of like settle yourself. Adam does a thing and, and he's taught me a thing where if you have to talk about something stressful, do it when you go, do it while you walk. That's like the simplest ingredient. Yep. It doesn't even make sense. Oh my gosh, does it make sense? Mm. Like just when you have to talk about something stressful or figure something mm -hmm. out that's not going to be, may not be an easy answer. You got pieces that don't fit. Go for a walk. 
And the the thing that I've learned working with Adam, I guess it's been this year's 20, 20, 11 years, Adam. Did we just have an anniversary? <laughs> We're, about anniversary. To. We're about I to. We're about to. I thought it was June, end of June. What was August? Off the, off the this is like a married couple, right? <laughs> I know. <laughs> we don't care anymore. We stopped counting. We just love each other. Um, but so the thing is, more times than not, early on when I have to go into conversation, and believe me, when I'm 20 years older than Adam, it's a you know approaching things like adult-child relationships does not work. You have to both be adults. And then at yeah. the end of conversations, I thought I was so glued to an answer. And then he, we would talk about it. And we would end up coming with a third answer. I'm like, oh, this third answer is so much better. So I've just over time learned to trust that that's going to happen. And we even talk about it at the beginning of conversation going, okay, now I want to do it this way. You want to do it this way. But if we talk about it, we'll come up with a better way. Yeah, there's, there's two things there. One thing is never have a serious conversation setting. So if you can at least stand, I'm standing right now. I would never have a serious conversation or an interview or anything setting. You don't right. think well while setting in my experience. You're not as creative. Stand up. If you can, Move. go for a walk. I have 95% of any problem solving call walking the rail trail behind our office. 95% of them, or I'm at least outside standing. Yeah. So that's the first thing. The second thing is don't say how things how you think they should be said. Say things how that person needs to hear them to understand what you mean. That means you have to, I, I call it being a chameleon when I like go to a company and talk about soft skill leadership. You have to first understand that person and then become a chameleon of that person and then say it how that person needs to hear it. I would prefer to say things direct. Phil, you're gaining weight. Lose weight. You'll live longer for it. Yeah. But that doesn't work. That doesn't That's work. That's not with a natural anybody. thing, though. I want you to know I've been trying to lose weight. No, he, I'm actually well, in I a pretty good fighting weight him. now. That's right. Yeah. I told him five years ago he was getting a bit tubby. No, <laughs> he just did it on his own because that's no, how it's, I, I, I agree with Adam. I would rather be more direct sometimes and just cut to it. And then you burn bridge. So you just have you to. You can be direct kind of with meet. us. Oh, that's, yeah. That's fine. We, we, we are okay so receiving it. We just can't <laughs> yeah. give it that way. Yeah. No, you same have to meet the other I guess Same in energy. marriage. What do they that call it? Um, like mirroring or mimicking or. Right. Yeah, um, it's, it's, a, yeah it's mirroring. That's a communication style as well that we've. I've, I've noticed people in sales meetings, they talk about kind of try to detect the energy of the person. Because if you go in all excited and they're trying and they're relaxed and cautious, you're going to like the bullshit detectors going to go off. Right. It's too much. Right. Yeah. So you have to meet that energy and listen to the cadence to how they're enunciating. Yeah. If um, you can also sway a conversation a bit like that, you have to be extraordinarily on to do these things though. And I don't think most people can be this on all the time. It burns your brain up, right? Like if you have a fire in your brain, you can't perform. But if someone's coming in with high energy and you know that you need to bring their energy down, you bring your energy way down and they yeah. meet your energy like, like training and they'll come down and then you'll have a better conversation. Yeah. If you need somebody to be more fired up about something, I can't talk to you like this. I have to really get fired up to boost them. Pull it and out of them. Yep. Yeah, it's like, hey, yeah. we're going for a run right now. And it's like, I'm not going for a run. Yeah, you're going for a run. We're going for a run. I'll drag your ass outside. We're going for a run. We and then we get go. outside and we have a nice walk because I've set yeah. the expectation we're about to sprint for a few minutes. Now we can have a nice walk because you were, you know, dragging a bit today or feeling down or feeling bad for yourself. Move the energy the way the energy needs to be moved. But that's... That's, that's easy. That's actually something you can train. You just have to practice it. Um, it takes a tremendous, <laughs> tremendous amount of practice. Just right before this conversation, I was outside doing some, some work with my, my youngest and he, he, he had done something, put something in the wrong place. And How old is like, your okay, youngest? Just frame this. I want to, he's 18. He's 18. So he's not oh, that okay. young. He's not like and, eight. And, 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 and it's awesome. like, he, so, so the stuff, the thing that he, he put in the wrong place needs to be moved. And, oh, I, he says, I'm not going to do that. That's absurd. And he said, I'm not going to do that again. He said it twice. Mm. I said, fine, I'll go do it. He goes, well, I'll go do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. No, you won't. Right. I said, well, I'll you just said you're not going to do it. So I'm going to no, go do it. No, you can't do it. No, I'll go do it. Right. 
<laughs> you just have to give them permission to to want to do it. I guess I don't. Yeah, it is interesting. If if only there were a place where people could have more conversations like this. So this is my my segue oh, well into your your retreats that you offer. You offer two different retreats. So you have a spring retreat and a fall retreat. Maybe maybe let's just pay a tribute here to the spring offering because they are different from each other. And I know yeah. you have a, a a banner that you put these under, which we also must address. These are called AEC Acoustics. This is where you can go to learn all about acoustical treatments and materials and <laughs> sound attenuation, no. bad insulation, right. Right. STS ratings, right? Yep, yep. Sounds transmission, right? So, <laughs> so let let's set the record straight first around the name because that's the overarching banner of the two different um, retreats that you offer. Uh, yeah. but, but then we'll get, we'll get it, we'll pay homage to the spring one and then we'll get into the, the, because I think what we're talking about here really lends itself to the, the fall retreat, which is, which is coming up. Right, so coming up. let's talk about the name. Let me just go back up a little meta on this. You would not believe the, th- the flurry of text messages Adam and I went through going back and forth. I was so excited about this, like acoustic idea, AEC acoustics and metaphors and, icons and you know why it's acoustic and i thought it was so obvious when we got the little icon label and my goodness architects going why are you doing an event about acoustics it's kind of niche <laughs> i mean to me no, that no. icon is the metaphor for why it is so obvious <laughs> by the way no one else people. no <laughs> no one else had an issue engineers didn't have an issue contractors don't have that an is issue. true it was just architects that had the issue but i i I I probably remember this story really clearly. We were talking on the phone saying there has to be something that's conversation focused, not sponsorship focused, or just like hard teachings on PowerPoint or with technology open. And I used to play the guitar. Phil still plays acoustic instruments all the time. And we said, well, conversations kind of have a melody and a rhythm, right? We went really highbrow with it and um, said, I wonder if like acoustic something is taken. It had to have been, mm. right? Because there's so many insulation companies and things like that. And I, I got on hover.com, you know, AC acoustics. No one has this. Yeah. Why does, why don't it's they have Dubai. the .com for this? I was like, yeah, I'm going to put it in the cart just because we're, yeah, ta- we should grab we're talking about rhythm and melody. Every business starts with a website. You have right. to get a good do- you- domain. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. So if you ever had a conversation with a company that's not in rhythm or not in melody, it's a terrible conversation. It's a terrible company to work with. But if you yeah. go in into a business and talk to them and they have a rhythm and a harmony with each other, you're like, this is going to be a really special project. Right. So why not set something up that uh, attempts to allow people the opportunity and the place to develop rhythm and harmony and have conversations? That's where it's Adam used to always say the best part of every conference were the conversations you'd have after the presentation. Because during the presentation, that whole presentation always works. It's amazing. It's like, look at this technique. Yeah. And then you ask the, the speaker a question quietly. You don't want to ask them in the class and embarrass them or ask them a tricky question. So later on, you kind of corner up and you go, so what, what's the deal with this thing? And they go, oh, yeah, that doesn't work. Here's what you, you might want to do it this way. So <laughs> under you, perfect conditions is how I know, it under, under, yeah, in the right. In front of 100 people. Yes, it works. But when you want to do it a little bit off script, oh yeah, that'll break. So we, Adam, you say, you know, these presentations after the conferences, are the best part of the conferences. So that was kind of a, a meta theme. The idea of something being acoustic is that it's quieter. It's the acoustic version of the louder events, which are all great. We have to go to them, but yeah, sometimes lovely. you just want to get away from the, from the noise for a while, get away from feeling that you're being marketed to at every moment you're being advertised to. So it's the acoustic version of those conferences. MTV so, unplugged. That was yeah. That well, part. we thought about right. like BIM, BIM unplugged. That was kind <laughs> yep. of a thing. And Adam and I have been talking about this a long time, and there, there just didn't seem to be the right inflection point because um, we had some great. I mean, we have Autodesk University. There's Base Camp every couple of years. We have Built in North America, and then when it looked like Built wasn't going to happen this year. I was like, Adam, if we're going to do something and we're not going to have an event with 500 people or even a hundred people, I think part of that acoustic theme is that you have to be able to have honest conversations with people and get to know people. So keeping it at 50 
is one of the things is like, we're not going to have an event of 500. We're just going to have an event of like no more than 50 people. Oh, and coincidentally, that's how many people fit on a motor coach to go for an offsite. Right. So instead of having the <laughs> first motor coach that everybody rushes buses. to get on, then yeah. you have another bus with three people kind of like right. going, oh, this is a boring bus. Yeah. Right. So you just want to, and, and it removes complexity. Like all the stuff Adam and I talked about, like a conference that doesn't have lanyards, doesn't have PowerPoint, doesn't have being brought to you by signage, doesn't have obligatory marketing sponsorship. Right? It's just like let's just gold tier, kind of turn all tier. that. Yeah. No, 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 yeah. no. And we've we people have asked to sponsor the event, and we've said I don't want anyone turning into Lake Swan Camp seeing brought to you by. It's just like no, this is this about you. It's about good food, the best things in life to me are good meals with friends. And so it's about that. It's about sharing with people that you trust. So that's the we overall idea of AC acoustics. And if you look at the only thing I did that tweaked it, cause Adam like went out and nailed it. It's like, okay, it's this, it was a word bubble with a sound wave and the nice colors, the blue, the blues. And I changed the word bubble just to make the second little, what, what are those little pointy thing called on word bubbles? Yeah, like the waveforms. No, no, the little pointy bit. So I was like, we should have two little pointy oh, bits, which indicates you, it's... Yep, that's right. Yeah. It's a conversation, and, and, not and one And underneath way. that image, there was all of these red lines where things lined up and stuff, and I was sending it back to Adam. But, and then the other thing was the waveform. Instead of being waveform, is it's a metaphor for a skyline, which is a reference, yep. of course, to AC. Mm -hmm. And then we're like, so proud of ourselves. I'm like, See, this I, is I, I'm not great. intelligent People enough to... So, I'm not intelligent enough to go 100%. <laughs> I just had to get it to 95%, 95 and then and hand then it off. And then you all. show it to people, and they go, why are you guys doing acoustic events? It's kind of niche. <laughs> Come on. So, yeah, so, it's like, exactly. and, so we did this. We did the fall event first. That was in 2020 during pandemic. And Evan, you and I talked about why. We, that was important to me personally. And then Adam has endeavored to do a technical event focused on best practices and really getting people in a room to figure out nobody knows what's going on but what are some good vectors and we we held the first one this spring and i thought it was just a wonderful success like suspiciously wonderful it was great like some <laughs> smart people really super smart people like harlan brum was there from autodesk and carl storms was there and craig barbieri like really smart people and saying some wonderfully complimentary things like one of the somebody back we were chatting one day on the deck. And this is a very modest environment. It's a camp in North Florida. Um, but we book out the whole camp and then we bring it. It shits staff. with but the acoustic. It uh, does. Theme. And somebody yeah. said, we need more of this. What do you mean? He goes, this. We need more of this. And he's standing on, standing on the deck looking at the lake and he goes, we just need more of this. And I thought, you know what? That's it. That's it. It's okay. It's on a That's a good board. endorsement right there. Yeah. We need more of yeah. this. So, yeah. And this is a guy who goes to all the big events that we love, but sometimes right. you just need to unplug a little bit. This episode is made possible with support from Guardian for Revit, because even superheroes need sidekicks in the BIM world. Are you ready to say goodbye to the model headaches and hello to a smoother BIM management? Meet Guardian, a revolutionary Revit add-in that's like a command center for your BIM strategy. Guardian is dedicated to helping teams protect their models, automate consistency, and ensure a standard of quality in their Revit projects. With Guardian, you'll save time, avoid mistakes, and build trust in your system. Guardian takes a holistic approach to improving the user experience by providing the data and solutions you need to address issues quickly before they become a problem. Through actionable insights, you can customize the Guardian settings to reflect your firm's standards and best practices with in-the-moment user education and project protections. Guardian ensures your teams can focus on what they do best, building, designing, and engineering. Trusted by firms worldwide since 2018, Guardian is your go-to add-in for the complex world of BIM. With immediate and measurable ROI, Firms have saved thousands of hours by preventing mistakes before they happen. Are you ready to elevate your team's Revit experience? To learn more or take advantage of a free 30-day trial, visit www.getguardian.tech slash trxl. Together, let's take a stand in the new proactive era of BIM management. My thanks to Guardian for supporting this episode of the Troxel Podcast. And now, let's get back to the conversation. 
we have the technical event. How would you describe that, Adam, if we're focused on the technical side of things? We still have good conversations, but it's not it's a, a roundtable format, right? And yeah. The way that you you do it, it's not like a one to many. It's it's we we come together, we have a discussion about a topic potentially, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. So you you have basically a host, and the host is kind of frame the topic, and Phil and I help narrow the topic a little bit based on the people coming, because you wouldn't want to speak about something that no one wants to discuss, right? You wouldn't want a topic that's seemingly random. Um, it has to be on some kind of vector, so you have to curate it a little bit. But um, this, this, the inaugural event for the roundtable was one to many because there was there was enough people to generate a large discussion with each one topic. large discussion. Yeah, but we did realize afterwards that that's probably as big as it can get. Like we would have to break it into different conversations, but there's opportunities to do that because what a general contractor is facing technically and needs to have conversations about might not be the same as an architect, Mm -hmm. but they should both be able to read each other's leave behinds. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to capture those conversations as well in executive summaries and follow up um, podcasts and recordings just to, to help keep the conversation alive on the website for, you know, the next year. So people can see what's actually happening. Um, If you could, also record the conversation that happens after the conversation's supposed to stop. That's the real special thing. So yeah, that was even it's conversations almost a primer. after those. Yeah, 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 that's right. It's almost that you you created a primer for people to stay up. Grown men and women staying up until 1 a.m. talking about something that they thought they didn't care about. And yeah. you have to like that's look important. at your door and go, hey, could you guys keep it down? It's, it's, it's one at it's one a.m. No one's drunk. Sleep. They're like no, what? no, no alcohol. Really, that's right. Not loud drunk. They're, they're just talking. Yeah, they're, about... they're not. They're just having conversations. Like, oh, I really appreciated when so and so brought up this. I haven't thought about it that way. Mm-hmm. Um, I gained a tremendous around, amount of respect for people that in our industry you would not know they exist, and they came to this conference. And I'm like, why are they hiding? Yeah, they have a wealth of knowledge that their team understands they have and they're moving into a management or leadership position, but the industry needs to hear them. There's a, there was a tremendous amount of value um, in doing that. And my family got to come. So it was really easy for me yeah. to make the decision. In line with the, the idea of being the kind of quiet acoustic environment, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of posturing in the industry. You know, the people that get to speak, get recognized. There are so many smart people that, don't have the I, w- I want to speak gene but when you get to know them and talk about what they know you learn a lot and i feel like you know this is an environment for t-shirts and shorts and leave your expensive watch at home we don't even have lanyards like it, that's just another complexity for creating an event for 50 people and you have these you know if we're if we're the conversation after the presentation well, to Adam's point, we end up being the discussion after the conversation. It's like it goes, right. it goes to a deeper level. Another and, level. Yeah. And it's if if I put it, if I said there's 50 people at AU that I've got to catch up with, they're like all there. Like right. yeah. Marty Bros Manith, who was the original Revit product manager, was there, and Harlan Brom was there, who's a present Revit product manager. Like th- we had good discussions and got to be part of that as well. And I think we just don't have enough of that. We have so many technical discussions about finishing the project where teams have to get together and talk about, okay, what's going on this week? What's the deadlines? What's going on? But from a leadership standpoint, the idea of getting together and going, okay, how's the team? What's the energy like? How are people doing? What's happening? Yep. We don't have conversations like that. And that's right. What I think it, that even happens at the technical event. So I really like this balance of having an event that's technical where we can share things or at least vectors with the industry, like Carl Storms did amazing. I think he was the he was the first facilitator. He talked about AI, and he had been going through a series called 100 Days of AI, where he was testing out all this stuff. But Carl didn't get up and speak and tell us what he thinks for an hour and a half. We went around the table. I learned about tools and technologies I didn't even know existed that had nothing to do with visualization. It was amazing. That's right. So the technical event feed that part of me that, is curious about all these tools and all these techniques. They're hard skills. You could probably you get on a vector. I don't know if everyone's ever, ever, ever been a part of a book club, right? You, you, when you go to book club, you read the same book and then you discuss the chapters. This is like a book club where everyone read a different book, 
but you get to right. learn what book they read. <laughs> right. So I can say I read 30 books this year now because everyone read a different book, or you may have read part B of the same book and I read part A. Because I'm from the South, I may have interpreted what the book said differently than somebody from yeah. another part of the world. And those conversations are, re well, as we learned, they're actually really difficult to facilitate. And we need to have more like learning objectives, learning cues or ways to get conversations going instead of just setting. Because my number one rule is conversation should be when you're standing up or moving. We set the whole time. Right, right. So I, I learned immediately that we had great conversation, but we can still do better. Mm -hmm, and right. I actually think this roundtable event is a good segue into the leadership event. So for the technical people, they're highly technical and want to discuss things in broad, but it doesn't have a psychological aspect at all or an empathy focused aspect. Come to that event. But if you see yourself being moved into a position of empathy and adaptability, and you're going to have to start taking accountability for things at a higher level, you should come to the second event. You should now come to the leadership event. Yeah. Um, or if you want to do that, you aspire to do that, then you should come yeah. to the leadership event. Look, it's hard to transition from technical guru where you are holding on and in control and you've got hands on gears and dials. You know, the metaphor might be like, you know, the steam engine and you're the engineer of the engine and you've got all these dials. And yep. now the reality is, I think, in order to be very successful, you have to let go of that. And learning to let go is stressful. Um, and, and we've all dealt with smart technical people that will have it their way or the highway. And this is how we're going to do it. And boy, do people just not trust them. Because hmm. yeah. you, can't, you can't enjoy the success of doing it that way. But if people, if you'll actually let go and trust, I read this about Churchill during the war. Um, he would have loud yelling matches with his generals, but he never overrode <laughs> them. And his thinking was, if he was right and they went into the next campaign, they couldn't take ownership of that. And if he was wrong, they would despise him because people were, you know, what happens. And, um, but I think letting go is... Letting go and, and trusting, not just delegating, but actually letting go and let people have ownership is the only way to succeed since. And it's a hard thing for technical people to do because we have been mm -hmm. conditioned that the way to success is figuring out the quote unquote right answer and then making sure that that right answer is implemented. And sometimes the right answer is, let's just, I, I had a great mentor and Adam knows him, Dave Heaton at Revit Technology and later Autodesk. He would just say, well, what do you think we should do? And I would go, well, we could do this or this or this. He goes, yeah, but which one we should do? I go, I think we should do this. He goes, well, let's just do that. And if it doesn't work out, we'll do something else. And that answer to doing something a certain way of, well, let's just do it that way. And if it doesn't work, we'll do something else was so freeing and so stress relieving that if I was wrong, I was going to be accountable and and demoted or whatever. It's like, oh, well, then let's just do that and then we'll do something else if it doesn't work out. It's like, oh, not only can we do it this way and I think it, that's the good way, but if it doesn't work out, we could do it another way that I think might be the good way. And Dave taught me that in a, in a wonderful way. I've been fortunate that I've had good mentors. So I think that's what the leadership part of it is about. And so these are the kinds of things that people could experience there, right? You've got a wide range of experience and you've got, so you've got people who have been there, done that. And to mm. your point earlier, Adam, like Phil's got 20 years of experience and he wants you to be successful. So he's going to not have you start from a blank page and figure everything out on your own and reinvent the wheel. And, you know, there's all these cliches we could say about, yeah. about doing it that way. But then there's like, this is a place you can go and tap into the knowledge base of people who have literally been there and done that and have had yeah. a wide range of experiences and help you formulate how you're going to achieve the next thing that you're going to do. Yeah. I mean, the, the opportunity here is very different from other conferences where you sign up for a bunch of classes and you walk an expo floor and it's very salesy on the expo floor side of things. Not always, right? But but you, you right. go to see the wares too, so you know what you're signing up for. But but you're going there to like 
tick off a bunch of boxes. I get the feeling that going to a conference like this, you don't know what the boxes are, right? It's like you're going and, and it's a very open minded and that, that should be the approach to this is like, Maybe maybe you identify some goals ahead of time of like here's what I'd like to walk away with. Oh, we and have then, a structure, yeah, sure. Y- and and the then diff- you the world is your oyster at this, and you get to figure out who can help you get to where you want to go. Yeah, I think Randy's done a great job. We we have a framework around good leadership that I mean it goes back to 2020. You talk about you know the 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 kind of ingredient skill set, and this year we're going to explore that more in the context of. Uh, implication from leadership standpoint like like how you communicate up how you communicate down how you Mm -hmm. how you listen how you yeah there's there's a there's a framework and structure for that i think the the big piece is from a leadership standpoint is leadership is not headcount you might have a team of three people just to be a good leader just to be someone that's trusted people can't come to you and tell you bad news if they think you're gonna pop good leaders don't pop good leaders go Oh, good. Tell me more. Let's figure it out. Mm-hmm. And having that appropriate blink reaction. Um, and then ultimately, if people trust you more, you end up with more opportunities. You end up growing. You didn't mean to grow a team of people or a team of trusted connections, but that it's nice. But the, I think for me, the key has been you just have to let go. And it's hard to let go of that feeling that, oh, if you're just not worried all the time, something's going to sneak up and get you. Like you have to let, like letting go of the inevitable, letting go of the worry and not being detached to the point of suspicion. You still have to care, but being, and not confident that you always know the right answer. That's where we're trying to facilitate with the leadership retreat. And it's helping people, it's helping in the most, in, in many cases, high technical performers go from being, recognized as the high technical performer is uh, we know people that technically perform at a very high level and then they don't know that people go i can never work with them they'd be Mm -hmm. so difficult to work with and they keep Mm -hmm. losing opportunities and they're smart people help them make that transition and then they're that frustrated other side of the conversation that adam had like i want to be recognized for what i've accomplished and what i've done and it's like on the outside, I can see exactly why you're not being considered for that position, right? And, yeah. and you can, yeah, yeah, it does happen. So let's, okay, there's two subjects I want to talk about. I want to talk about the other aspects of the leadership retreat that are location exclusive kind of things that you guys do. I want to talk about the food, the, like, because I think your approach is really interesting when it comes to that. Um, but before we do that, I want to talk about permission because there are people in situations where they can just say i'm going i'm going to something like this or i'm going to go next year or i i can't go this time but but the spring one sounds great right. they have that they have that ability to do that but then there's a lot of people who are like man i really want to do this i have no idea how to get approval for that from my organization from some leadership mm. can you guys just talk about what what has I know you have talked about this before, so let, let's talk about that part of it. Now, you actually have a really, I think, good way of thinking about this. I, I'm actually met with probably 50 50 because of where I am, just in my age and my progression, there are less people in a managerial or leadership position. Most people are still five to 10 years away from it. And so they see this. I actually had somebody tell me Monday of this week, Adam, I want to go. I need to go to better myself first, knowing that it will better the people around me and better the business around that. So I, I call that communicating in three prongs. You have to communicate inward to yourself first, outward to your direct team, and upward to your management. And if you can't do all of those, you failed. Hmm. And some of us do one of them really well or two of them really well. And they have no capability to communicate up to management because management is so disconnected from their current position that these people are thinking about taking five days off and paying for it out of pocket mm-hmm. yep. because they think it's such a value. And I would say half, maybe 40% do, do that I anyway. I know people that do it because they're like, I've I don't want that. people in the company yep. that know about this. So they don't ask because they're afraid it'll get out. Yep. Oh, Isn't that or, crazy? Or you just, you just see the value of investing in yourself, right? And, right. Well, it, and, and ultimately it, it may come down to that in some cases. You know, even if you go to like the Autodesk University, 
they do this thing where it's like, oh, do you want to convince the boss to go download this form? Right. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a thing you have to download because they're like, well, how, how is this going to return on the investment? And so there's lots of things about both events that we try to keep below the fold. Like the first thing that you see when you log in is not that we bring a French chef to a private event. That's below do. the fold. The first thing is probably quotes by smart people who have been that said why this improved their relationship interpersonally, in our office with customers. Um, every good, you know, I think management re realizes that good leaders and and the team that's managing the business have to have good soft skills, or at least somebody on that team needs to have the soft skills that are important for keeping people from leaving because they get frustrated. Um, so th for people that are already kind of in management leadership positions, they can kind of delegate, like they have things that they can go to. It's the ones that are on that cusp that go, oh, I should go to a leadership thing. It's like, oh, well, we don't want you to be a leader. You're the bin manager. We try to keep the important things on why good leadership is important, even for bin managers above the fold. So without scrolling down, what should the C level see if they go to this website? And we do that for both events. We try to keep, so there are some very practical things by keeping the event at a private camp in North Florida and bringing a chef, including like you, you sign up for these events that are $2,000 and then you still have to pay for your transportation and hotel. Our events are below $2,000, like early bird for the leadership retreat is 1500 bucks. That's Everything about how to get there. That's your accommodation. That's offsite. That's food, everything for the week so that there's no surprise. And so it's like, oh, you paid 2000 for the event. And then you had to get a hotel that was $300 a night. No. So in practical terms, keeping it's reducing complexity wherever you can. I, th I think Adam and I agree. It makes a better. Event. I think I have two call to actions. I think about. Because every, everything I do has to be, t it has to be a call to action and accountable. Otherwise there's no point talking about it. Um, one is like, if you're thinking about one of these events, show management that whoever signs off on your budget, show them the videos, let us speak for it. So you don't have to. Mm, yeah. That's the first thing, because then we're accountable to that manager, not you. That manager can call us. Call Phil or I will both have a very different conversation, but both conversations with, will end with you wanting to send someone to go and hold us accountable for the event, not the person asking to go. Secondly, if you're in a position like the many I've talked to in the last couple of weeks where management doesn't apply a budget to them, I would say roll the dice on yourself. It's a cheap enough entry fee and it's a quality enough outcome of conversation and networking and just the psychological part of it and the empathy part of it and the managerial part of it, gurus charge three, you know, 30,000 bucks for this. Do you want to, do you, do you want to go to Tony Robbins or do you want to go to Randy Ben? Randy yeah, Ben will teach you everything Tony Robbins is talking about, but with no ego. And it's not 30 grand to go see him. And there's, there's armed security around the building. So take a risk on yourself. Like if I was in where I am now, at a, at a, I would like to believe I would be in a management role, but let's just say I'm not, I would take off and I would take a, a gamble on myself because that gamble pays dividends. If you think investing in NVIDIA three months ago or four months ago was going to pay dividends, invest $1,500 now and see the dividends in five years. Um, so I would say that there's two ways of solving that problem. Hold us accountable, first of all, because that's what I want to be. I want to be held accountable for anything we turn over. It's, um, it's up to so us to justify let, it for your management. That's right. Yeah. Let it, let us speak for it so that we don't have to train you to speak for it and then come learn how you're going to speak about it for others and fight for others to do events like this. I don't suspect this will be the first event of its kind. I think it will be replicated. I think it will be replicated all over the world in the next five years. I think that people are going to get back to a, kind of a, a grassroots, smaller format, highly conversation-based retreat. I think people are yeah. craving it. Everyone I talk to craves it. It's just always, well, I don't know if I can take the time off. I don't know if I have like how to explain it to management. Let us explain it to management. It's the send kind them of thing the links, where- Send them the podcast. Go ahead. But it's, it, I think we want to create an event that if people said, I would spend my own money to do to this, go to this. But it- but for some people, they go, fortunately, my company pays for it. But for other people, they go, you try to create an event that people will say, I would spend my own money to go. Because I go to technical events that 
I think some of them, I mean, I know I have to go to, but I don't necessarily, I wouldn't necessarily spend my own money to do it. And so if you create the kind of event that people would personally want to attend, and we have people that do, um, and they, they told me why they do it that way, they pay for the event, they take personal time off, then you're creating something that's um, authentic. It's personal, right? That to me is what, what makes it so valuable. Because I think a lot of people go to something like an Autodesk University. There's t thousands and thousands and thousands of people. You can actually go hide there, right? It's in Vegas. You can actually just go to a casino the whole time if you wanted to, right? There's no accountability in that. Then you do. In a small event like this, it's extremely personal and it is interactive and participatory and kind of mm. what you put into it. I think you're going to see dividends on getting back out of it, but it is completely different. And you can still talk about the same kinds of topics you can with AEC leaders that you have access to at either one of these events. One of them, they're going to have five minutes for you, Max. In an event like this, they're going to have an hour for you, right? I, right. Th it's just you have personal time because you don't have all the distractions. You don't have the entire schedule of everything crammed into a day and you've got to be on this side of the expo center at this time and you've got to be in this conference room and it's not like that right you're in a you small know, venue it's i have pe had people ask they looked at it and they um said you know this looks like a junket you guys have a you guys have an offsite on monday at the beginning where you go down this river and people paddle or they paddleboard and kayak and um i would approach it in this way when you mention it to your senior that you want to go to the event go and by the way it's alcohol free because that doesn't happen in the industry you go to these events and there's open bars all the time to me that's mm -hmm. the junket and that's where it gets noisy and adam and i've done that we have there's no moral obligation it just introduces complexity like there's a there's a lake there's paddle boards there's canoes i can't have the risk of anyone drinking and getting hurt and then people wake up before sunrise and they go for a walk so it's kind of a, it kind of works out. It kind of fits all together. But if you tell your boss, I want to go to this conference or this retreat or this round table, and it looks like there's no alcohol for the week. To me, that kind of sets an air of, oh, this must be a serious thing. Like it's, mm -hmm. you're going to be unplugged for a little bit. Yeah. A lot of those, a lot of the, let's call them the, you know, the bigger AAC companies that go to the larger conferences. I've heard that they know they're sending people there. And they don't get anything back from it. Mm -hmm. Like even the the recap afterwards, hey, Evan, I'd love to send you to so-and-so conference this year. Um, could you do a 45-minute presentation when you get back? And six months later, they're still asking for the 45-minute presentation. <laughs> the presentation. And then yeah, they right. still send them to, they'll send them again the next year because next year. Wow. They, they think without visibility, they don't maintain their status as a company. And you just you just kind of cued into it. You're actually kind of invisible because there's so many people. So if you're trying to be visible, that's not the right place to do it. And if you're trying to be accountable, that's not the right place to do it. The right place to do it is a small circuit, a small conference of some kind. And then you can be highly accountable and you can be highly conversation based. And you can actually do that 45 minute presentation the week you get back. I, I mean, Quite frankly, you could do it with just notes because you're going to have so many notes on a little eight and a half inch notebook that you could wing 45 minutes. The mm -hmm. thing you're never going to be able to impart on people is the, the associative feeling of being at an event like this. Where like people can understand what it's like to be in Vegas. We've all seen movies, but I don't Vegas know how to conferences. explain. To, right. I don't know how to explain to people the feeling associated with the noise being shut off and you being able to focus on a conversation for two whole hours. I had two hour long conversations <laughs> with people yeah. that didn't exhaust me. But in oh, Vegas, right. the first morning I'm exhausted. Um, but there's a so thing it, it, and it's, it's just hard. part of the, it's part of how it flows. You go, you get in all these classes and you're packed in and you're, you know, elbow to shoulder trying to make your way to the next session. And then at the end of all of that, the exhibition hall opens up and it's loud music and you're in line with your ticket to get a drink, to have a chat, to decompress. And so we're just going to do the whole thing where you're decompressed. If decompress means like in the afternoon, we decompress and we, for three hours, it's open time to just, if you want to go for a walk, if you want to journal, if you want to read, if you want to have a chat, if you want to go down lakeside and grab a paddleboard. And then after dinner, 
like Randu go, you know, guys, whether let's just go down the no- to the dock and watch the sunset at the lake and we'll have a wrap up session. Like why, why have a set aside time where you decompress? Why not make an environment for a week where the whole thing is meant to decompress and reconnect with people, try to put your phone down for a bit. I mean, during the open time, people have to sometimes send email and get back to the office, but create an entire week where people can decompress. And I was really nervous about the first event of not having alcohol because we were going to do something a little different. And someone came up to me at breakfast and said, you know what, normally at these events, I would be a little hungover in the morning and I'm kind of tired and groggy. But this morning I woke up 15 minutes before my alarm went off. So I thought, I'll just go for a walk and watch the sunrise. It was really nice. And I thought, oh, that's what I like. Yeah, I watch the sunrise. I mean, when's the last time you watched the sunrise? When's the last time you watched the sunset? Like those moments, they're, it's a beautiful, quiet time. And doing that after a nice meal with peers where you're learning stuff. Anyway. Yeah, I, cool situation. I, I think there's one, th- there's one thing that I learned that is probably not apparent, but it's a huge value add. I learned it at the, the last event is we used to go to the large conferences to see the new things. See what people have been working on. I saw more new. Of? I saw more new technology from just Kerry Thompson alone than I would have an entire <laughs> exhibit hall. <laughs> yeah, from one probably, pen, some guy and, from New Zealand. He came all the way to yes, this round right. table event. He's a cr- he he's a mad halfway scientist. across the world, and he was yep. he was the expert between yeah. classes. Like, hey, have you thought about this for doing this? I use this for this other thing. These other three tools have helped me do this. And I'm like, wow, you've just done. Fifty thousand dollars worth of marketing for those companies. You really should really get a guy. kickback from it. But I, <laughs> I learned that if you're going to see the new things, the people that are there are highly curious and know what the new things are. I have conversations twice a week oh, with yeah. startups. Yeah, I can tell you a hundred pieces of technology you shouldn't be using, and I can tell you the three you should care about. Phil can do the same, but we're not going to go set up a booth at a large conference to tell you those things. We want a small group that's polite and casual, and we can do it there. But just you know, there's Carrie a lot alone, of times I learned. I had a conference full of great. products we could talk about. No, you go to conferences and there's booths and there's this technology. You know, it's like this. It's like the uh, presentation where it works in front of a hundred people. This technology is amazing. You go back to the office a week later and you're trying to catch up on work you missed week four. And you start playing with it. You're like oh, this doesn't do what I thought it would do. And then you have to kind of go through the stages of grief to figure out if it's even going to work. I like the nice thing about talking to people that have used it that can tell you where the landmines are and how to, okay, it's really good for this, but it's not good. But don't think it's going to meet your expectations over here, but here's why you still might want to use it. Like to me, those conversations are really valuable. It's um, the, the thing about the leadership retreat is we make these transitions in life from being a young technical person to then having families and mortgages and there's stresses outside of the office and inside the office, but it's just, like the leadership retreat has helped me in my own just personal life, trying to it just, you know, the kids are getting older. Like, what's your purpose once the kids are grown? Why do you keep wanting to do what you do? What's your, what you, I still think struggle is important in terms of mm-hmm. purpose and having something that you struggle with, but like learning to let go and learning to find good mentors. Randy Ben is a wonderful mentor. And the fact that we get to sit in a room with him and we talk about these topics and then I noticed that people will go away and have one-on-ones for half an hour or an hour. And I don't know what they're talking about and I don't want to know. So the thing is like at the round table event, all the stuff that we learn there, we can share in whatever form we want to. Whereas at the leadership retreat, what you learn can be shared, but what is shared stays. We don't have executive summaries of the leadership retreat like we would have for a round table event. Um, maybe sometimes people share things that are a little bit close to home stays inside the retreat. That's, it's a, safe, that's why it's a, right? yeah. it's, it is a safe space. Yeah. Randy yeah. sets the ground rules for that right at the beginning. He's like, what we learn, you can share. What we share stays here and people respect that. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I feel like we should wrap up, but I can't finish without talking about the cuisine aspect of this. Can you talk about, about that? Because I think uh, this is, again, this is an anomaly when it comes to conferences and how you handle this. Well, we like to have a big fancy dinner at the end of the event. We're like, well, why don't we just do that all week long? 
So I've known Chef Charles. <laughs> Three <laughs> fancy <laughs> dinners a day. <laughs> like I know, to the point that people go, actually, I, last year I was like, Charles, this is too much food. It's amazing. But we can't do this. Three. Yeah, Chef Charles is a French chef who started his apprenticeship when he was 14. And there's actually a, an interview, a long-form interview on YouTube with me and Randy and Charles. And you just get to see the wonderful, beautiful energy and spirit that he is. And without exaggeration, he prepares meals for heads of state, for rock stars, for multi-billion industry executives. And then he loves to come to Lake Swan Camp and be part of this group and make cookies. And uh, he's just wonderful. So what we do is, I mean, Lake Swan makes amazing food. It's camp food. It's camp plates. But I thought, you know, if we could just have some, I was thinking the second year, like, who could we have? And we said, Jeff Charles is just, I should just talk to Charles. And Charles drives his own car from Charlotte. He goes to Sam's or Publix or wherever. He gets all the food. You know what? Because you can get certain food with like ordering systems, but Charles wants certain things. I'm just about to release a menu. Adam's seen it. He does an amazing job three times a day for our on-site, off-site events. He'll have snacks ready, you know, uh, infused waters because you got to have nice, healthy drinks. And um, he just, they love him. They love him. Nice. Chef Charles shows up. He comes out. He, oh, oh. The food is not served like you stand in line and ask people for more of this and less of that and could have a little more of that. It's all served family style. So you might have to say, Adam, could you pass me those potatoes? You know, it's like a table full of people passing each other food and the food comes out. Charles, Charles plates it. He brings it out. He describes what he did. And uh, then he goes, bonjour, y'all. And he goes back my, to the yeah, kitchen. My, look, you, you, you just said it. My, my favorite part, right, is that because he's French and because he's polite, he doesn't just give you food. He tells a story about the food. He does. And then he presents from. the food. He does. And I've never been to an event, an event in my life where you can have five-star dining in shorts and t-shirt and feel comfortable <laughs> and feel like you're at home. And he somehow like an does that by telling a story <laughs> and then saying, if you need anything, let me know. Have fun. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, it's Charles amazing. He yeah. he loves it. He's he's uh he's just wonderful, wonderful energy. Oh, Charles' son works for Autodesk. He's the HR director in EMEA. Like that's just a weird thing. And uh, but Charles will come out. Yeah, so it's a little aside. I get so excited. Um, he he comes out. He he describes what he's done. He he puts plates out. And and every dietary restriction is covered. Um, yep. you know he knows all of that. And, uh, but he's just part of it. Like any event, I don't think we've ever been to an event where the chef comes out and talks to you and says, this is what's going on and here's what I've done. And, and, um, so there's just a wonderful familial event to that. And, um, I think the best things in life are good meals with friends. It's such a simple yeah. thing, but there's nobody sweeping under your chair and trying to get you out so they can put the next table in. And I remember. I get giddy now when I see people pull out their phones when Chef Charles breathed out food and everybody's like taking their own little photos. <laughs> right. But then I, it was Nick Kramer. Uh, he's a director at LPA on the West Coast. And Nick looked at me once and he goes, Phil, I'm eating Instagram food on camp plates. And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. That's a good way. I like it. It's, uh, it's authentic. It's right. authentic. It's Instagram meals on camp plates. Yeah. Like, so, you know, the so plasticky how camp plates kind of clink and clank, like your school trays when you're a kid. It's that right. sound. It's not fancy well, one, silverware. Yeah. One one story I have to tell is my my daughter came. So she was three at the time when we, uh, the last event, came to the round table event. Mm -hmm. And we don't do sugar. Like, we just don't eat sugar. She doesn't have sugar. Uh, she doesn't have iPad. She doesn't have phone. She plays with <laughs> Legos and she plays outside. That's what I did. That's what she's going to do. <laughs> you can learn the computer later. You can eat sugar <laughs> later. And... Chef Charles brought out like a, a pound cake he had made with ice cream on the side and went to set it down in front of us. We're like, oh, we, we'll, we'll skip this. And he goes, you'll have Chef Charles pound cake. You'll have <laughs> Chef Charles ice cream. And he goes, and, and the little one can have twice as much. And I was like, we, we don't do sugar. But he, we don't do sugar. He's, like, he's like, it'll be okay. It's Chef Charles. It's Chef Charles. It's, and I was like, <laughs> okay, fair enough. So now she'll yeah. ask. My daughter will say, when, when are we going to go see that guy that made all the food the good um, and that, let me, that, and let that, me that. have ice cream. And I'm like, well, I can go see him right now. You want to drive and see him? Chef Charles, yeah, I think it's amazing. 
He but is. He's, he's going to feed you a dessert. So yeah, Adam um, looked over at the round table event and he goes, "We got to hold on to Chef Charles." <laughs> Actually, in our post mortem, right? I said, yeah, that's I, "I don't care if we get rid of anything else. He is staying. We got to get. We could change Charles. everything, but I will fight tooth and nail, yep. <laughs> keep him at every event, and until he wants to leave, and then I'll still fight to make him come back." <laughs> Yeah, he uh, he just does amazing. The photos online of him preparing lamb racks for one of the events, like how he sources his food, all of yeah. this stuff is is beautiful. And the first year, he said, "Phil, I'm very busy. You know, I'll do it once, but I can't guarantee that I'm ever going to be doing it again." And then on the second day of the event, he was lakeside, sitting in the lifeguard chair, doing FaceTime call with his wife Lee. He's going, "You've got to come. This place is amazing. I love these people." And then by the end of the week, he's like, you know, if I was ever going to retire, I could, I could work. What am I talking about? This is crazy talk. I'm never going to retire. He's just wonderful energy. That's and it's, awesome. it's just, it's just, a, it's just all these wonderful pieces have come together. And the sum is greater than the parts. And I'd love for other people to experience that. And Adam would too. Well, and you framed it, you know, in, in there somewhere about having a meal with friends, right? And that, and, and it goes back to your early having breakfast with mentors to glean insights. Like mm. it's a great spot to have meaningful conversations and it doesn't have to be about work. It doesn't have to be out about professional development, but all of these things we know they weave into each other in different ways. We find something that you, you pull out of this conversation and it applies over here where you would have never been able to connect mm. those dots. Should you not have been in that conversation to have that experience? Right? So this is a place that is fertile for this kind of interaction and, and participation. And I think that that is worth talking about. So I would just, at this point, I think invite you to give the details about what, when, where, you know, all those kinds of things. And, and we'll put links to all of this in the show notes for the episode as well. So I, I want you to tell everyone, but then everyone should also know that all of the details will be in the show notes for this episode. AEC Leadership Retreat.com. No. Is that right? Don't go there. <laughs> Don't no, go to that no, website. No, it's just, it's just AECacoustics.com. Click the leadership. Oh, yeah, tab. that's right. Sorry, Adam. Yeah. No, you're good. I'm so excited. Uh, there, uh, AECacoustics.com. Like, the, all, yeah. All of the interviews we've talked about, they're still live on the website from the previous years. They're all there. Go see how Chef Charles talks. Go see how Randy talks. <laughs> um, and then hold us accountable if you don't think they present themselves well. Reach out to us. Talk to anybody um, who's been there in those photos. You probably know them or you can figure out who they are. Send them an email yep. and ask them. Yep. I, I appreciate That's how you guys do offer advocacy on others' behalf to make the case for why it's valuable to go to something like this. So I hope people do take you up on that for sure. So I'll have links to your LinkedIn profiles and aecacoustics.com in the show notes for the website so people can reach out to you if they have additional questions if they need help uh making the case uh and and thank you so much for for having this conversation today i think you know big picture the transition from technical to people from single to teams is a huge jump in one's professional development and there is not necessarily a roadmap and this is a great place to go get shortcuts so that we don't have to start with a blank page with people who have been there and done that in their way over you know various years and years and years of time um, so it may not directly apply but I think you're gonna get some amazing ideas and amazing insight and you're gonna meet the people who have who have accomplished what you're talking about. So this is this is a great, great thing for people to definitely pay attention to. And I hope that uh, everybody can, you know, f 50 people at least will show up and, and be at this retreat. It's going to be great. Thanks, Evan. Thank you, Evan.